whether you've been in church all of your life or today is the first day that you've ever been in church, I think that we can all agree that we have questions that we need answers to. Questions, things that we're just not sure about regarding God, regarding heaven, regarding the Bible. Again, it doesn't matter if you've been in church all of your life or today's the very first day you've been in church, we all have questions that we'd like to get answered. And I've been doing ministry now for almost 25 years, and there are some topics, general topics, that I think most people have questions about. And I think one of these topics is creation. Like, how did all of this happen? Is God actually a creator, or was there this giant explosion and then all of this just happened? Sometimes we're just not sure how it happened. I would say the people that, have a, uh, that struggle with believing that God is a creator haven't yet experienced maybe the fullness of his power and who he is and what he is capable of. And we, we just tend to think, well, it's, it's a result of this giant explosion of the Big Bang Theory. And I would say this, it's harder for me to believe. Think, think of it like this. If you were to get a box and go to Home Depot, go to Lowe's, and just start going down the aisles and filling the box up. You take the box, and then you, you go out in the parking lot, and you throw the box of, maybe you've got like a screwdriver and a piece of wood and some nails and like just stuff. You throw it up in the air, and it lands, and when you go to pick it up, it's this perfectly formed Rolex watch that's working absolutely perfectly. To me, like, it's harder to believe that than there is actually a creator who is unlike us, but is capable of anything at any time. He is a, a creator. That's one of the questions people have. I think another question that people have about the Bible is about sex. Now that I've got your attention, uh, I think people just, they, they question it. They're like, I don't understand it. And let me start with this. Sex is a God idea. The devil got a, a, kind of took it and did what he wanted to it, but sex is a God idea within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. Essentially what God did is he said, Adam and Eve, you're naked, go figure it out, knock yourself out. Put them in the garden and they, they figured it out. But a lot of people have questions about sex. And the thing that I want to talk about today is what I believe a lot of people have questions about is the end times. Armageddon, the apocalypse, maybe you've heard it called Judgment Day, but I think a lot of people just aren't really sure about what all of this looks like. And throughout the series, again, it's not what you think. And my hope today with our time together is maybe you'll begin to think a little bit differently or get some questions answered that you had regarding what this actually looks like when Jesus returns. So again, uh, I, I hope that you open your heart, kind of maybe be willing to think differently than you previously thought that God can speak to you in a personal way and we can leave here knowing who he is and who you are. Let's pray as we get into this. Jesus, thank you today for an opportunity to be in your house with your people. Um, Jesus, that we would hear clearly from you and we would, res we would respond to your voice. Jesus, help me, help them in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and amen. So let, let's talk about this. Are we living in the end times? There's, there's a lot to unpack really with, with this question. And I think you've got to understand a little something about who we are at TE Church before I even start this. And at TE, we say there are things called majors and minors, and we major in the majors and we minor in the minors at TE Church. And let me talk about what the majors are. And these are things that if you are going to be a Christian, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, these are non-negotiables, things you absolutely have to believe. And one of these things is that Jesus is God. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a good teacher. He's not a rabbi. He is, in fact, God himself who dressed up in skin and came to earth and dwelt among us. That is, that's a major. You've, you've got to believe that. The next thing is you've got to believe that he was crucified, that he was put on a cross for your sin and my sin. He died, he was, he was put in a grave, but come on somebody, three days later he rose from the dead, he's still alive today. 
We have to believe that. If you're gonna be a, a Christian, that's something that you have to believe. And the third thing that is a major that you have to believe is that salvation is only through him. That you can't be good enough, it's not about you doing a lot of good things to make up for the bad things that you've done. Salvation is found in one person and that is through Jesus. He said, I, bold statement, I am the way and the truth and the life. He said, no one gets to the Father except through me. Those are major things that we all have to agree on if we're gonna be Christians. Here, here are some things that we call minors. A lot of churches get caught up in this stuff. Can I drink and be a Christian? That's a minor. Uh, here, here's my thoughts on it. Um, the answer is probably yes, although um, it's really clear that you shouldn't drink too much. The Bible was really clear on the amount but Jesus' first miracle was water into wine. So I would believe the answer is yes, that you probably can drink and be a Christian. Although it says in 1 first, first Corinthians, all things are permissib permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And I want to pause in this moment and say just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And there are some people in the room you absolutely should not even go near alcohol because it is an issue for you and you just shouldn't touch it. But that, that's, a, that's a minor to me. Yeah, I think you could be a Christian and have a drink. Here's another thing, and some churches this is a really big deal, um, speaking in tongues. For some churches this is a major. For TE Church it is a minor. I believe that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. However, I do believe that speaking in tongues is absolutely real. It's in the Bible, the Bible talks about it. Many of us maybe have a prayer language in our context on Sunday morning. It is not a priority at TE Church. Is it real? Absolutely. Do people do it? Absolutely. Is there a time and a place for it? Absolutely. I'm just saying it's a minor. We, we don't get caught up in that, although I do wanna help you. Now, some of you uh, recovering Pentecostals are gonna get what I'm talking about today. I wanna give you a crash course in speaking in tongues. Can I do that? Some of you are like, Pastor, I, I wanna speak in tongues. I'm gonna give you a crash course. You ready? You, it starts out by you rebuking someone for buying a Toyota. And you go, shoulda bought a Honda. Should about a Honda. Should about a Honda. Hallelujah. Should about a Honda. Should about a Honda. Should about a. That's, that's your crash course in speaking tongues. <laughs> there you go. You're welcome. Anyhow, that's, my point is that's a minor. Okay? We don't get caught up in that. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a major. Here, here's another thing. When we talk about creation, some people get all caught up in how long did it actually take God to do this? Is it really, really six days? And I would say this, it really, really doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Some of us are like, is it possible? I would just say this, God is not bound by time. He is the author of time. And what a day is to you could be something completely different to what a day is to God. And I just know that sometimes we get caught up in this. And God, listen, the Bible is not a science book. It is a history book. It's not so much about how as it is about who. And we just have to be reminded this is about who and what God did with people to get us to where we are today. Does that make sense so far? So we have majors and minors. Here is another minor. It's what we're talking about today. It's the study of eschatology or the end times. And at TE Church, this is absolutely a minor. I'm not telling you that it's not important. I'm saying that some people go like over the top in this. I'm gonna just let you know right from the start, I am not an expert in this field. And there are people that are self-proclaimed experts in this field, and I would say no one really is an expert in this field because no one really knows when Jesus is coming back, and we're gonna talk about that today, but I just kinda of wanna kind of set the record straight that let's agree today that we may disagree on some things, and if you're gonna send any hate emails, um, send them to my wife, she's much better than that than me. So, I'm not gonna read it, okay? So let, let's do this, and I'm gonna give you a little different take. Again, we're talking about um, it's not what you think. And I wanna give you three areas that I believe the church misses it when it comes to the discussion of end times. 
three places that the church misses. It doesn't get it right when it comes to the end times. And if you're taking notes, here's the first thing, is the way we talk about it. I think that's like we miss it in either like we, we don't talk about it. And the reason we don't talk about it, can I be honest, is because as soon as you start talking about the end times, man, you are opening the door to all the crazy McCrazies to come in. Because when you start talking about this stuff, all the crazies come out of the closet. And some of you are like, well, there's no crazy people here today. If that's you thinking that, I'm just, I'm just saying maybe, I don't, I don't know. But there are people like they get into this stuff and it's super, super deep. So some churches go, I'm not even gonna talk about it because we're just opening the door to a bunch of, to a bunch of wackadoodles and we don't wanna do that. So I think that you need to talk about it, but the way that we talk about it absolutely matters. So I have a Twitter account. I very rarely tweet. I'm just on there because it makes me feel really sane because I see how crazy everybody else is on Twitter, so it makes me feel good about myself. But I saw this recently. Take a look at this, uh, this text. This was a, a tweet somebody put out. An invasive species of spider the size of a child's hand is expected to colonize the entire East Coast this spring by parachuting down from the sky, researchers announced. This is a real thing. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Giant spiders, the only thing that could be worse than giant spiders coming down from the sky are cats coming down from the sky. Can you imagine being, um, you're laying out by the pool, it's in the middle of summer, it is a great day, and all of these flipping cats just start parachuting down out of the sky. I'd be like, Jesus, just take me right now. Just take me home, I'm done, We're, I'm out. But what this person, watch this, what this person was doing that tweeted this, they were trying to warn people for what was about to come. And the Bible is about 30% prophecy, and it's to tell us what is to come. And out of this prophecy, there was a percentage of that that talks about the end times or what is to come returning Jesus' return. And it's for two reasons. The first reason, watch this, is to encourage believers, and the second reason is to warn non-believers. And the, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this to, the, to a church at Thessalonica. He, he's saying this because there's some people that are a little freaked out about when Jesus would be coming back. So he writes this in 1 Thessalonians 4, starting at verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Let me just pause and say this. He is coming back. He is coming back. Did you hear me? Like, this isn't a maybe. This isn't a minor. This is a major. He is coming back. And it says he is coming back with a commanding shout. Now, I don't know what the shout's going to be like, but I'm from the 80s, and I'm thinking if Jesus is coming back, it's like... Let's do it. I'm thinking tone low. Like, he's ready. Like, that's it. Maybe you have a different idea. We were talking about this in the creative meeting. I told our team, he's coming back. Let's do it. Tone low. One of, one of the guys in the meeting who happens to be our sound engineer, he's an old school rocker, you know, and he said, no, I feel like it's going to be this. All aboard! <laughs> I said, he's not coming back as Aussie. I promise you. He's not coming back as Ozzy. So, Tone Loke's a stretch, and I don't mean he's coming back as that person. He's not Hindu, but I mean, that's not the announcement. You, you can figure out how he's gonna come back, but he's coming back with a commanding shout with the voice of the archangel in the trumpet call of God. I do know how the trumpet call is gonna be, though. Rocky, you know it's gonna be Rocky, y'all. Like. He's gonna come back like, let's go. I was down, but I'm back up. Anyhow, now stay with me. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Now, that's gonna be wild. Some of y'all, I can't believe that. You've watched The Walking Dead, I'm just saying. <laughs> then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And then he said this, so encourage, here it is, each other with these words. So this is supposed to encourage us, not freak us out, not make us go like, oh my gosh, I, I don't understand this. this, this is crazy. And 
what, what this is talking about, when Jesus is coming back, it's referring to something that we call the rapture. Now, I know there are Bible nerds in the room right now, and they're going, Pastor Tim, there is no such word in the Bible. Number one, that's why you don't have any friends. Number two, <laughs> I understand that that word is not in the Bible, but what it's referring to is something that we call the tribulation, okay? In the tribulation, there's two trains of thought on the tribulation, and one is pre-tribulation. And pre-tribulation is before the Antichrist comes and rules the earth for seven years, that the church, the bride of Christ, will be taken up, that we will not be here, we will not have to deal with anything because we will already be gone. That's pre-trib. I am absolutely pre-trib. I just believe I'm not gonna be here, I'm not gonna deal with it because the Bible says in Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I just believe if you are a follower of Christ, you don't have to mess with it. There's another train of thought that is post-trib, and that means the Antichrist will come seven years, we're gonna have to deal with all of that, and then the believers will rise with Jesus. Pre-trib, post-trib, minors, doesn't matter. Like, at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you why this doesn't matter when we get to the end of this message. But number one, the, this, this whole thing is, I think that it's a problem because the way we talk about it. So let's talk about it in a way that makes sense to people. Sound good? Number two, here's the second mistake the church makes regarding end times. We set dates. We set dates. There are a bunch of people getting married this year in our church, like 50 couples, I don't know how many. But like, you, you set dates. I know my um, youngest daughter is getting married this, this summer. She's getting married to, uh, to Noah. And um, they know the date, but I know it's in like July. <laughs> I don't know the date. But it, there, there's a date that's set. Now married people in the room, how many, how many married people in the room? Awesome. Like, you have an anniversary date, and I can promise you this, all the women know it, about half the men know it, but there's a date. You've got that, right? But watch this. How many parents do we have in the room? Put your hand up. Parents, okay. So when you were pregnant, I'm talking to the girls because I don't care what Twitter says, only women can have babies, FYI. Just throwing that out. Like, just, just throwing that out. I don't want to be too controversial, but like, Women have babies. Okay, anyhow, so when you were pregnant, here's what the doctor gave you. Gave you a due date, okay? This is the date that I think this baby is going to arrive. Let me tell you how many babies are actually born on the due date of 5%. Some babies are in there like, I'm not coming out. I like it right here. Some babies are like, let me out of here, like a month early, too. We call it premature. How many of you know that God's timing is always perfect? Never question the timing of God, that God is always right on time. I don't care what he's doing or who he's doing it with. But we set due dates, and the due date is an approximation of when we believe the arrival will be. What I'm telling you, when it comes to the return of Jesus, we have a due date. In other words, he doesn't tell us the exact date, but he gives us some signals or some signs of what we can be looking for when he does actually return. So I'm gonna put some dates up on the screen. T take a look at this. 19, 14, 15, 18, 25, 32, 41, 75, and 94. You know what those dates are? Those are the dates that the Jehovah's Witness said Jesus would be coming back. Nope. Nope. When I'm a product of the 80s. How many people from the 80s here? Awesome. There was a book out in the 80s called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. I'm just saying, um, man, I'm glad that wasn't true because I wouldn't have made it. You know what I mean? Like, I wasn't going. I'm like, but, but it didn't really age well, did it? I always thought this would be so funny, and sometimes this messes with me. Have you ever... And I, like, listen, I'm, I'm a pastor, I get it. I've been driving to work sometimes, and like there's no one on the highway, and I'm going, oh my gosh, did I miss it? Like, did Jesus come back? Did, did I get left behind? And then there was that whole series of books 
oh, if that doesn't freak you out, like if you're not sure about Jesus, just read those books, watch the movies. You don't want to be left behind. I always thought it would be fun sometimes to like invite a new staff member to a staff meeting and then just have like everybody's clothes on the chair when they walk in and then, like nobody in the room. I don't know, I thought that would be funny. Um, <laughs> sorry, bro, didn't make it. Anyhow, here's what you need to know about Jesus. Jesus didn't give us a date, but he did say that we could know the season, okay? He said, I'm gonna give you some signs that you can start looking for so that you will know that it's getting close. And with that in mind, let's look at what it says in Matthew, what Jesus said in Matthew 24, starting in verse 32. He said, now learn a lesson from the fig tree. And some people a lot smarter than me believe this is referring to the nation of Israel, okay? When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In other words, pay attention to the nation of Israel. In the same way, when you see all of these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. And then he said, I tell you the truth, watch this, this generation, now, what's a generation? The generation that saw Israel form as a nation. And a generation, you have to remember this, is approximately 80 to 90 years. So the, the people that saw Israel form as a nation, that generation, watch this, will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, here it is, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. So most people, again, much smarter than me, think Israel plays a major role in this. But see, Israel was pretty much destroyed 2,000 years ago. And they've been wandering, they, they, they're known for wandering, aren't they? The Jews, and they've been wandering, they were wandering for literally 2,000 years until, watch this, in the 1930s and 40s, there was this demon-possessed crazy person named Adolf Hitler who wanted to destroy the Jews. He wanted to kill, like a genocide, kill every Jew, and he gathered as many Jews up, uh, as many as six million people, six million Jewish people, and watch what he did, this is horrific. He burned them, and then he pushed their bones into a pit. Watch this in Ezekiel 37. The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? O oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. And if you read the rest of this, the bones literally come back together. And many people believe this is symbolic of the nation of Israel that came back together in one day on May 14th, 1948. They became a nation. This is unheard of. If you know anything about history, like countries don't become countries in one day. This just, the, the United States, after we declared independence, there was still an eight-year process for us to become a country. And Israel, in one day, becomes a nation. Now watch this. We shouldn't be surprised. Isaiah told us, who was a prophet, told us this would, this would happen. Watch this, Isaiah 66, verse 8. Who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Whoever has heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day, wow. Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But by the time Jerusalem's birth pains begin, her children will be born. 2,000 years before it happened, Isaiah said this would happen. And Jesus said the generation that sees this happen is the generation that would see him come again. This happened in 1948. The generation is 80 to 90 years. What does that tell me? It tells me we're close. I don't know the date, but it tells me 15, 20 years, there's a really good chance Jesus is coming back. Like, it's, it's happening. I don't know when. We'll know the signs. We'll know the season. I believe this is really clear in saying this we could be the generation that sees the return 
of Jesus. So number one, the way the church talks about it is a problem, right, Re regarding the second coming. Um, we set dates that aren't accurate. And he here's the last one, and this is where I'm going to land today. We're more caught up in the what and the when, and we forget about the who. How many of you know that when you have a young child, everything is different? Like, everything is different. Let me give you an example. If Pastor Lynn and I want to go out to dinner tonight, 15 minutes, we're, we're where we want to go. If you have a young child, and you decide you want to go out for dinner, you might make it on Thursday. <laughs> Am I right? Because there is so much that goes into it, you just don't get in the car and go. I mean, it is a whole thing. There is planning involved. And, and let, let me tell you, like my oldest daughter and son-in-law, Betsy and Nate, they've got a new baby, seven months old. He's awesome, Judah the lion, he's great. Yes, he is the best. I'm telling you, he's the best. But like when Betsy even comes to our house, we just want her to come over. Like, she literally, parents are gonna get this, you buy different vehicles based on how many kids you have. It'll determine your vehicle. For years, Pastor Linda and I, we, we were blessed to drive a, come on somebody, a minivan. You know what I'm talking about? Minivan. You didn't have a choice because it was about the kids trying to get the kids in the vehicle. So we, we drove a, a, a minivan. But when Betsy comes over, I'm telling you, it's like going away on vacation to Europe for like three months. And there's, there's different things you bring. There's one like bag that, that has like all of the necessary things. Like if, if you're bottle feed, you got the bottle. If you breastfeed, that's a whole nother world. You got pumps and like all this stuff that you got to do and you milk that's, fro I don't know, it's a lot. So you got all that. And then you, you have to have diapers. And then you have to have toys. And then you have to have the right, the right binkies. And then you have to have additional outfits in case there's a blowout. You know what I'm talking about? By that blowout, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you have to have extra clothing for, for the baby. And then now it's a completely different level because like <laughs> Judah has this thing that he wears on his foot um, so that it tells you like how he's breathing. I'm like, it looks like the kid has an ankle bracelet, like he's on house arrest, he's seven months old. Like, I, but it's just what, what we do. There's all of these different, different things and then these things that make noise and all. I'm like, wow. And I, I remember when Betsy was little, in fact, our, our first one, it wasn't that crazy, but Linda and I, we still had all of this stuff in one time. Listen, this is so crazy. We were packing up the minivan and we had all of our stuff and we had everything in the minivan. It like took forever and we're getting ready to drive down the street and we look back and we go, where's Betsy? <laughs> like we, we had everything in the van and watch this and we forgot the most important thing. The most important thing wasn't all the stuff the most important thing was the person. And what I'm telling you is sometimes we can get caught up in all of the stuff, the what and the when, and we forget about the who. The book of Revelation, it's the last book of the Bible. Most people think, well, this is a book that's just about the return of Jesus is about the end times. And I would say that it includes that, but it is certainly not limited to that. This book isn't just about end times. This book is about a person who came to earth, who dressed up in skin, God himself, who was almighty, who was holy, who was perfect, who was pure, who has come and dwelt among us. And it says in Revelation 4, 8, day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And sometimes we get so caught up in the is to come that we forget that this is about a holy God. This is about a holy, like wow, like a holy, perfect God. Revelation 4.11, just a couple of verses later said, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. Do you know how much time I spend thinking about end times? It's 
Zero. But do you know how much time I spend thinking about Jesus? Every day. Because if I know him, I don't have to worry about the what and the when. Because I've got a relationship with the who. And I, let, let me, can I just be really vulnerable with my church today? Can I do that? Where we're going right now, I have struggled with over the last week and what God wants us to do. Because what I want to make sure of, that every person in our church, whether it's your first day here, or you've been in church all of your life, you can know that heaven, that your eternity can be sealed today. Because if we went around the room, I promise you, there are some people you're like, I don't know, I hope. Like, I hope I'm gonna, I hope I make it. Like when judgment day comes, when this is all over, either he's coming back to us or we're gonna see him. But you, you can know. Jesus gave us a roadmap. It's not just like what well, we just have to hope and, and kind of believe. Can, can I just walk you through a couple things? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give every single person in our church today an opportunity to know without a shadow of a doubt that you can spend eternity with the Lord Jesus in heaven. And here's how he said this works. Watch this. In John 17, three, he said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Christianity at its heart is knowing God personally through Jesus Christ who has revealed God to us. If you, don't, if you don't know him, it doesn't matter if you call yourself a Christian, it doesn't matter if you attend church, it doesn't matter how faithful you are. If you don't know him, you don't know him. So the first thing is like, I wanna make sure that you have a relationship with God. But here's how it starts. These two verses, Romans 10, nine says this, watch. So you will be saved if you honestly say, another translation said, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and if you believe with all of your heart that God raised him from the dead. So what does the Bible say? You gotta say it, okay? You can't just think it. People say, my faith is personal. No, it's not. We, we've made it personal. It, you can have a personal relationship with Jesus, but your faith was never meant to just be personal. It was meant to be public, okay? Does that make sense? So we, ha we have to say it. Now watch this. This is where it gets interesting to me. Matthew 10, 32, this is from Jesus. He said, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Okay, so what's it saying? A couple things. That we have to know Jesus personally. And it starts when we make a public confession, when we speak it out loud, where we say, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe he's, he's the Savior of my life. But watch what it says. This is, this is where I think the tension is. It says that you gotta do it publicly. And um, this, is where I, this is where I kinda went back and forth all week. Because there's one part of me that goes, man, I, I never want this to be weird for anyone, and I never want anyone to feel uncomfortable in our church, and I'm always like, man, I just wanna make sure. Then the other part of me goes, but what does the Bible say? Like, I, I keep, does that make sense? Like, what? What I think really doesn't matter. Like, I don't want it to be weird. I don't, but then I look at, well, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that you have to, like, you have to say it, and you have to, you have to do it publicly, right? And, and here, here's my hope, and, and here's what we're going to do today. And again, I don't want this to be weird, but I want to know, more than anything as your pastor, I want to know that I'm going to see you in heaven someday. I, I just want to know that. I want to know that I see you in heaven. So, so I don't even know what time it is, but we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to do this. And uh, I'm, I'm going to ask every single person in, in the room, whether you've made a, maybe in your mind you said, yeah, I'm a Christian, but maybe you've never just publicly confessed. And I'm not going to have you come up here on stage, every single person. But what I am going to have you do is I'm going to have everybody just get out of a row. And just, we're gonna come up and I'm gonna have some ministry people up here. You're not, you don't have to get prayed over. You don't have to do any, like you don't have to. All I want you to do is when you get up and you come forward and then, then you're gonna say, hey, gee, I'm just telling you, like Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And then we're gonna, we're gonna high five you and we're gonna say, awesome. And then you just did what the Bible said to do. 
And then you can know based off of not what I think, but what God said that heaven is yours. And some of you are like, ah, oh, it's uncomfortable. I get it. I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, I would rather you be uncomfortable now than uncomfortable forever. Okay? So I'm, I'm just asked that, that you dim the lights and I'm, I'm just gonna kind of, this isn't rehearsed. I don't have this all figured out in my head. I just feel like this is what God's telling us to do. So I'm gonna have like Pastor Robert and Pastor Linda and like Angel and uh, Everett, if, if he's here, just get on a couple rows. I'm just gonna point to your row and I just want you to come up. And if it's your first time, here's the thing. If it's, you've never made a public confession, um, and this is your very first time, let them know because we'll have a Bible for you and we'll start a whole discussion. But for some of you, maybe you've been following Jesus all your life, but you're like, man, I've just never made a public confession and this is, this is your time to do that. So I'm, I'm just gonna have you like start right here. Just like come up and just say, hey, Jesus is my Lord and, and Savior. And it doesn't have to be weird. And just come up, like get out of the row and just come forward. And I'm gonna ask you to, over here to do the same. Like just, just get up out of your row and just come down. And then just go back and sit down. It's not gonna be a long time, but just kind of... again say hey I've never done this before so there's like this is new to me and just tell them Jesus is Lord and I want to follow Jesus today we're gonna to help you with that today today listen I know you're going like what what is going on like I'm so glad that you're here in the house today and just like come forward be be part of the family of God at TE Church and just just tell somebody man I I just Jesus is God Jesus is Lord of my life and I, I want that to happen today just just come up Somebody, Jesus is Lord, I believe it. All creation I, I believe it. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. I believe I it. I will adore you. I will adore you. Give me a hand. Forever bow down before you. God, that's a 
God's in the service. I will adore God, you. Rejoice in it, God, and be glad in it. somebody oh creation i sing praise to the king of kings lord you're my everything and i will i will adore you just say it out of your mouth say jesus is lord tell somebody jesus is lord i'm just confessing publicly jesus just do what the bible says jesus is back to their seats um, we've never done that in the 13 years of our church but we did it and, and if you said it come on welcome to the family of God come on I said welcome to the family of God that your sin that your past is all gone hallelujah only Jesus come on it's about Jesus today about Jesus today. So um, I'm going to pray for us and then um, Pastor Robert's going to come out and, and we're, we're going to finish up. But um, if you did this and you said, listen to what I'm telling you, if like you, you meant it, the devil no longer has a say in your story. Like it's, it's over. Now you just need to walk it out. And we're going to help you do that as a church. If it was your first time, make sure you go to What's Next. We have a free Bible for you. Um, you're never designed to do life alone. We want to walk with you on this journey. But today was a starting point that I can know as your pastor that I'm going to see you in heaven. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for today. That it's just not what we think. It's just not about all of these questions of the end times. It's about knowing Jesus and then we don't have to worry about anything else. God, that... Eternity belongs to us. So Jesus, what you started today, God, is, is just a catalyst. But we will now continue to walk this out, this journey that you've called us to of new life. Father, be with us so that we can show the world who you are and hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. And everyone said amen and amen. God bless you guys.